What do you think the rest of the year now looks like uh, for the business? So, so basically, I mean, we had the first mm -hmm. half, which clearly we saw as being challenging because of uh, our uh, Lantus franchise, our Lotus product, getting under some pressure because of lost exclusivity. So arguably is what happened. And as a consequence, we posted flat profit on flat sales for this uh, second quarter, as you say, slightly increasing profit by 1.5%. Now, when I get in the second half, I mean, a few things are going to drive growth. A, uh, we are going to see more growth coming from the launch of our new products, in particular Dupixent in atopic dermatitis and thereafter in, in asthma. We also are going to see our vaccine business getting back to growth after a bit of a challenging first half. So if I put all that together, or knowing that vaccine is a bit more uh, over, uh, over represented in the second half because we are selling more in particular flu vaccine, in the northern hemisphere this is what is really going to drive growth on top of that we are going to have the full effect of our uh, recent acquisition of biovarative in blood rare disorder as well as ablinx uh, also in rare blood disorder so altogether, this is what is going to drive growth and which allow us now to get to a three to five percent so we have narrowed and slightly increased the guidance versus what we are today on a full year basis. Arguably, it means that the EPS will grow faster in the second half of we have had around 1.5% in the first half. Jerome, the, uh, before we get to the new products, let me, talk, uh, let me talk to you about the products that you have in the market existing. A lot of other big drug makers have said they're going to hold off on price increases in the U.S. this year. That was your uh, statement at the beginning of the year as well. Are you going to stick with this policy to limit price increases in the U.S. to try and limit medical inflation there? So the answer is yes. Uh, this is really what uh, we came out with this policy now uh, two years ago. And I would say rightly so. I mean, hearing and seeing what's happening in the U.S. and the concern about price and the concern about affordability of drugs for, uh, for patients. So I think today, I mean, the uh, Trump administration and the parliaments as well are uh, trying to uh, discuss uh, uh, the blueprint and ways to, to uh, transmit this reasonable control of pricing uh, for drugs towards the, uh, towards the patients and have the reasonable transfer of that, which is not a, a small endeavor knowing how complex is the uh, is, uh, U.S. market. But we, as far as we are concerned, I would say we are somewhat proud to have been a bit ahead of uh, a number of our competitors here uh, with uh, this uh, price strategy that we, uh, or policies that we issued now two years ago. So yes, we stick to that, not increase price of drugs beyond medical inflation and um, price drugs based on healthcare economics when it comes to new drugs being launched. So is that, I mean, for you as finance chief, that must have been a little bit concerning, right? Um, is that policy weighing on your bottom line if you can't increase prices are you having trouble um, increasing profits or are you able to offset that say with new drugs in the market so that, that's i mean that's really a good question so uh, i think that it was a bit of an easy life huh, in this industry to just increase prices to make your to make your profit now we are clinging into a, a world and this has been around ex the US in many countries, in particular in Europe, for years. So in a way, you could argue that European companies were more used to that. Uh, the way to beat that is clearly, A, to have more new drugs and new indication being provided to patients. It's second around diversity of your portfolio. Uh, and third, it's also diversity from a geographic standpoint as well. So, and the fourth, clearly, is to continue to monitor your cost base and continue to generate cost savings and reduce the cost of uh, bringing a uh, drug to market, either through R&D productivity or through uh, uh, marketing and commercial efficiency. So, in, in short, uh, I think that's normal cost of business. And uh, it's true that you cannot expect to grow your, uh, your, top, your top line through price increase. Therefore, it has to be either volume or more importantly, new drug being brought, brought to, the, uh, to the patients and to the market. And Jerome, that respect, you just I would say about we are just coming. Yeah. We're just I was coming, just mentioning continue? that this fits well with what we are doing today. Yeah. You've got I'm a new head of R&D. 
Sorry, I, yep. think, I think the delay is slightly Same hurting again. us here. Um, the, you've got a new head of R&D. Um, the R&D department, I'm sure, is paying a great deal of attention to this interview, and, and they're listening uh, to, to what you're saying on cost efficiency and, and the, the need to keep the purse strings under control. I, when are we going to find out how much money that new head of R&D is going to be able to spend? I, what does it look like to you? The cost of bringing drugs to market, it, it, the inflation rate is, is high. Uh, wh what message are you communicating to the R&D department about, about how much they've got? So the, the new R&D is just new, uh, it just came a few weeks ago, so it's a bit early to just to tell exactly how we will uh, uh, refocus and continue to focus uh, our uh, R&D efforts and R&D spending. Altogether, he has a budget which goes somewhere between 5.8 to 8 to 6 billion euro, and it's not a small budget. And I think the point we are going to work together is how you make all this budget being more productive either by focusing on more value-added drugs, I mean, making our uh, clinical trial more efficient, uh, spending less time from one phase to another, and having an overall organization which is more productive. So we, ha we had started that now five, six years ago, but I think that John is going really to bring a new, a new step in this uh, uh, endeavor to improve R&D efficiency and uh, probably refocus a bit more of the uh, uh, the R&D spending around uh, really differentiated uh, uh, science on differentiated capabilities and accelerating uh, the um, I mean the time for new drugs to join to come to market and having the optimal way to do that using also not only traditional clinical trial pr uh, processes but also uh, uh, big data real world evidence and uh, you know, using more of the digital capabilities and using the more big data available across the world. Sure. Jer Jerome, I, I, you know, y you've been using uh, AI, you've been using big data in order to try and improve the efficiency of your flu vaccine, at least. I know you're looking at it in that sense. What other ways are you using AI and big data in your business or maybe even to contain costs? And how long until we know of the efficacy of, of, of using artificial intelligence? So that's, that's a good question, probably more than two minutes. So one is really around R&D, around using uh, uh, data available uh, to continue to track through real life uh, the efficacy and the safety profile of your drug versus others. And the, and the productivity you can gain there is absolutely tremendous, but also the information you get. Uh, the second is really more around access and around marketing. I think that we are getting into more digital marketing, multi-channel, I mean, very different accesses to both patients and physicians when it comes to uh, uh, prescribing new drugs. So uh, I, I think this is also an area where we are starting really to see significant productivity. And then it depends very much what type of drug you are coping with. Clearly in primary care is something which is more visible than it would be in very specialized care or in, in a rare disease, as an example. And the third area is more around manufacturing. I think that uh, we are heading to uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, plants of the future, let's say, uh, on a paperless basis and using also uh, uh, data available with much more of a remote uh, manufacturing and having a better yep. efficiency on your uh, uh, cost of production. So these are, I would say, the three areas of improvement. How much time it will take, it depends. But I, I would say that uh, in the two, three years to okay. come, you really see at the end some, some productivity visible in your, uh, your pre-analysis.